Part 7, Borrowing. Back in the village of Chin in Hand, Roxy figured families were probably sitting down to simple suppers of cabbage and potatoes, or beans and franks, or biscuits and gravy. She wished she had some of that now, a single biscuit, half a potato, an onion even. I'm hungry, Smokey Joe complained. I'm so hungry I could eat my shirt. I'm so hungry I could eat my sneakers, said Freddy. Help yourself, grumbled Helvetia. There's plenty to go around. I'll be glad to find some grubs if we have to, Roxy offered. Give it one more day, said Helvetia. I'm not that hungry yet. The four hooligans sat miserably together, some on the log and some on the ground. All held their stomachs to hide the sound of their rumblings. All licked their lips, wanting another drink. What if we drink all our water and still nobody comes, said Simon. What do we do then? We could make a bucket out of bark and collect rainwater, Roxy suggested thinking of the photo in Lord Thistlebottom's book. And what if it doesn't rain? asked Freddy. Roxy had an answer for that too. Then we could tear our shirts into strips and tie them around our ankles. Each morning, just after the sun comes up, we'd drag them through the seagrass and the rags would soak up dew. Then we'd hold them over our mouths and wring them out. Helvetia's eyes narrowed as she studied Roxy. What did you do, elephant ears? Memorize the whole book? She asked. Roxy could not bring herself to tell the hooligans that she was the niece of the famous Mr. Dangerfoot or that she had sat down to tea on two occasions with the even more famous Lord Thistlebottom from London. How could a girl be connected to them in any way when she was afraid of someone chasing her on the playground? So Roxy just said, I've been around. Simon Sarley turned to Hilvisha. Well, if she's been around, why don't you send her to the robber's tent again to bring back some food this time? I think you should send someone small enough to move through the seagrass. If the men are in the woods and quick enough to dart into the woods, if the men are in the seagrass, said Roxy. Somebody little like Smokey Joe. Don't look at me, squeaked the leanest little hooligan of them all. I... I get lost really easy. What? said Helvetia. One of you is afraid of the dark, one is allergic to bark, and one gets lost really easy? I've sure got me a sorry band of hooligans, I'll say that. Then why don't you go, Helvetia? asked Simon. Because, because I'm the commander, and the commander never leaves her post, said Helvetia. Never mind, said Roxy, I'll go myself. Strangely, she wasn't quite as frightened as she had been the first time. She had never jumped from a burning building or walked across quicksand, but she could do this. Off she went, and when she reached the seagrass, she got down on her belly. She crawled like a crocodile through the willowy weeds, stopping now and then to listen. When approaching an adversary through high grass, Lord Thistlebottom had written, Avoid the temptation to raise your head and look around. Stay calm and do not panic. Roxy's ears, her wonderful round pink handles on a sugar bowl ears, picked up the faraway sound of a small plane coming closer, closer, till it flew low over the island. Roxy longed to jump up and wave her arms, to yell and let the pilot see her. But she remembered to keep her head down, and she was glad for as soon as the plane had gone, she heard men's voices in the trees beyond, and it sounded as though Rat and Snake Eyes were having an argument. There's that plane again, Snake Eyes, said Rat. I'd sure like to know if they've seen us. 
And I'd sure like to know if you're lying to me about that water, came the deep voice of Snake Eyes. I count 21 bottles and there should be 26. We brought two cases of water with us, Rat, and we need every drop we can get. Now, where are those other five bottles? Well, you tell me, how do I know you ain't hiding a bottle every day or two in case we run out? How do I know you ain't getting ready to take all the money yourself as well as the food and water and leave me stranded out here? You're talking nonsense, said Snake Eyes. All I'm saying is, if you got five bottles tossed away someplace, then I get five bottles to tuck away for myself. I tell you I didn't take no five bottles said Rat, his voice rising. Yeah, says you. That's right, says me. There was quiet for a while. Finally, Snake Eyes said, You check that rabbit trap yet? Going off to do it now, said Rat. What about the fishnet we rigged up yesterday? I'll tend to that, said Snake Eyes. Roxy lay as still as a stick in the seagrass. She heard one man go off one way, one man go off the other. But now she had to look out in two directions, east and west. If she turned her head one way to follow one of the men, she was turning her back on the other. When their footsteps and grunts and coughs had died away completely, she slowly, slowly raised her head. She had only a minute or so, she knew, for she suspected that each man was going to spy on the other. Roxy crawled on her hands and knees till she reached the end of the seagrass. Then she continued to crawl until she got to the tent. Quickly, quickly, Roxy picked in one sack, then another, no food there. But in a burlap bag on one side of the tent, she found tins of tuna and sardines, cans of beef stew and spaghetti and beans. She had no can opener, however, so she settled for a large smoked sausage and a round of cheese. Stuffing them both under her shirt and into the waistband of her skirt, Roxy began her crawl once more through the seagrass. She had not gotten 30 feet from the tent when she heard a man coming back. She flattened herself on the ground, knowing that if she continued to crawl, they might see the way the seagrass parted to let her pass. She felt as though her heart would explode as it thumped against the earth beneath her. Anything in your trap? Snake Eyes called to Rat. Something took the down bait, but I didn't catch it, said Rat. Fishing line bring anything? Nothing worth cooking up. By the time you take the bones out of it, it would be just fins and tail, grumbled Snake Eyes. Their voices seemed so close to her now that Roxy was sure they must be looking down on her at that very moment. She closed her eyes in terror. The silence went on for another minute or two, and then she could tell by the men's voices that they had gone back inside the tent. Roxy edged forward and stopped. Two feet more and stopped. Two feet more, when she reached the trees at last and the man hadn't followed, she was so relieved that she allowed herself one big bite each of cheese and sausage. Nothing had ever tasted so good. There would be no grab sandwich today anyway. Just as before when she got back, the hooligans rushed to meet her and this time Smokey Joe tried to grab the food out of her hands. Where are your manners? Roxy said, jerking the food away again. You can eat one bite of it. We've got to make it last. You already had a bite, complained Simon. And so could you if you had been the one to fetch it, said Hovisha. Shut up and eat your sausage. When each of the hooligans had taken a bite, Helvisha wrapped the rest up in her sweater. They sat morosely on the log, wishing they could have more. This time the men will know someone was in their tent, Roxy warned them. They're bound to come looking again. What are we going to do? Asked Freddy. Where can we hide? Roxy tried to think what her uncle would tell her to do. As far as she could remember, there was no chapter in Lord Thistlebottom's book about where to hide from robbers on an island. But she remembered his advice on what to do when lost in the mountains. Do not panic. 
Use a stick to dig a trench in the snow. Get in it and cover yourself with leaves and branches. Digging in dirt was a lot harder than digging in snow, she knew, but the soil was loose and sandy and there was nowhere else to hide. If they went down to the beach, the men might see them. If they went to the rocks, the men could corner them there. Let's dig a long trench we can slip in tonight, Roxy suggested. We'll cover ourselves with leaves and branches and one of us will be the lookout. Dig they did. Some of them used their hands, the others used sticks. After an hour or so, they had carved out a trench just long enough and wide enough for all of them to lie in together. They spread out the pile of dirt they had unearthed and covered it with leaves so there would be no sign of their digging. Then they dragged over some branches to cover themselves. Who will be the lookout? asked Roxy. But before the question was out of her mouth, Helvetia and her hooligans had already crawled down inside the trench and were squeezed together all in a row. Never mind, said Roxy. I guess I'll do it myself. She covered the four with thick fur branches, then stretched out on the log and studied the stars. For once, she was glad that her ears stuck far out from her head because she was able to hear the faintest bird call, the slightest puff of wind, the merest snap of a twig, and so she lay, ears tuned to the night.